And now we're going to go into our international update. Um, so for those of you who have stuck around all day and had questions on how do I expand my brand outside the United States, you're going to be hearing from a group called GCNC uh, that's going to be able to provide that, that international update. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we get started, I wanted to thank Denise and the entire CWE team for the invitation to uh, provide this global update on cannabis um, at the event. My name is Chris Day, and joining me today is uh, the other co-founder of the Global Cannabis Network Collective, Jillian Reddish. Hey, everybody. We're really excited to talk to you today, not only about the world and movements and trends that we're seeing, but also to talk a little bit about the purpose behind the Global Cannabis Network Collective. We formed this organization in 2020 to serve a communication gap that we saw between multinational cannabis operators and um, the need for intercontinental and international conversations. Just as you can see patterns of repeated behavior as new states open up in the US, you can see repeated needs across continents and countries. And then it's important to also understand, adapt to and engage with an understanding of cultural and regional business shifts. So at the end of 2020, we did a virtual world tour and interviewed our members and experts uh, throughout South America, Mexico, India, Australia, Europe, parts of North America, to see things, see where things are headed and what we can likely read into the future of cannabis worldwide. So today we'll be providing a bit of a holistic view of world attitudes and approaches to the cannabis market. And then we'll be stepping through a number of countries and continents that are really helping to define what the market will look like over the next several years. So why is a global view important for the long term versus say a US centric or a North American centric view? Um, let's take a look at the state of the market uh, holistically around the world. Uh, largely we're talking medicinal cannabis as the primary driver uh, of cannabis right now. Generally around the world, there's a reluctance for adult use, um, but while many people are hesitant to discuss it politically, the trends suggest that over time, many of these medicinal, ca medicinal cannabis markets will shift into a more broad definition of medicinal use and become de facto adult use markets. But outside of Canada and Mexico, that is likely to take a while. So uh, let's start with Mexico and then dis we'll discuss South America and the rest of the world. Sure, Mexico is a great place to start because um, it's, I like to say it's on the brink of greatness. Um, since 2018, when the Mexican Supreme Court uh, established the right to legal cultivation and consumption of cannabis for personal and non-commercial use, there's been this ongoing dis discussion within the Congress of exactly what that legislative framework will look like. Now, truth is in early December, we really were anticipating that they were gonna vote and this was all gonna be done. That of course didn't happen. And um, the Congress was able to go back and get one more extension uh, to further that discussion. Uh, there were a few hangups. I don't think any of them are going to sink the legislation. It's just gonna take a few more months. Um, and they were, they were tied around things like uh, social equity and making sure that underserved populations didn't get left out of um, get, didn't get left out of the conversation. But because the legal document itself is still somewhat shifting sands, it's probably not safe to speculate here on what the final details will be. But directionally, we know that upon passage, Mexico will become the largest federally legal market in the world, and it's highly likely that it will have both medicinal and adult use uh, applications from the get-go. So uh, the current, you know, the current hangups aside, those will likely pass here pretty quickly. And Mexico is gonna 
approach finalization of the legislation. And that will add them to this movement throughout Latin America and South America, where a number of countries have already established their legislation and are ahead of the game in terms of being able to work through implementation of their own programs. Places like Colombia and Ecuador who have been seeing a lot of moves that they're making. Um, but, but Jill, uh, I know that you've been looking into sort of that, the details of some other places like Ecuador and Peru and Brazil and Uruguay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, South America is just a really interesting continent for cannabis right now. It's home to 650 million people, and the vast majority of those live in countries with some sort of legal medical cannabis. Um, so I'd actually like to provide just a brief overview of some of the themes in general, and then we'll touch on a few of the key markets that we think you guys should know about. Um, so just to start with an overview, largely South America has compassionate use special access schemes as the primary way for patients to be able to access cannabis medicine. Though, of course, each market is evolving with every year. Uh, for patients, some of the main barriers to access include the fact that price remains high and uh, health insurance coverage can be rare and is often considered last resort. For businesses, uh, some of the barriers we've seen are lags in issuing licenses and managing and enforcing international trade logistics. Um, though all that being said, there are meaningful and immediate revenue opportunities for the home markets, um, a little bit limited, but Right now, companies are focusing more on exporting rather than developing their internal markets. Um, but what's interesting from that we've been hearing from our GCN, GCNC members is that there is an appetite to change that. Um, I also want to just make note that we've seen significant investment in South America by Canada, uh, though globally that has started to pull back just recently. Uh, so I want to touch on a few of the key markets. Um, let's just start with Brazil, which is considered the largest potential market with 15,000 patients uh, that are allowed to import individually to access medicine. However, Brazil hasn't evolved its market beyond that yet, uh, though there is a lot of appetite uh, and eager anticipation, hoping that those regulations change in the near future. Uh, let's turn now to Colombia, where their domestic market has really advanced in recent months. Um, they've been able to sell preparations uh, with both uh, CBD and THC, and uh, they've seen um, export, exports in excess of $1 million of medicinal cannabis to about 20 different countries. And uh, 2020 also saw Colombia's first export of seeds available commercially. So there's lots happening there in uh, Colombia. <clears throat> Though I wanna turn, turn now to Peru. Uh, so far, Peru has totally depended on imports. <clears throat> Though it is trying to finalize uh, its cannabis legislation and grant their first production licenses. They're in the midst of that. Um, only a, a few things to note there, only certified pharmaceutical laboratories can apply for a production license. And in talking to a few of our GCNC members uh, based in Peru, we know only a few so far have registered products. Uh, there's definitely a need in Peru and several other countries down there too for uh, increased testing capacity and other supply chain elements to get the market really rolling. Uh, similar, kind of a similar situation in Ecuador, actually they've allowed export of flour, but it's uh, an evolving market right now, uh, one you should be watching for sure. And the, the final country I wanna to touch on is Uruguay. Oftentimes we tend to only mention Uruguay for its uh, notoriety as being one of the first countries to fully decriminalize cannabis. But there's in recent years, months really, there's been a lot of important developments for the global business landscape. So Uruguay so far has generated more export revenue than Colombia, and its uh, exports have reached countries like Australia, Argentina, Germany, Israel, Portugal, Switzerland, and even the United States. So one of the key factors that we wanted to highlight uh, that everybody should know about is the Montevideo Free Airport. This is the only free airport in South America, and it had, that's pretty important ramifications for cannabis trade. 
what they do is they allow for pick pack shipping from bulk from bulk shipments that can then go on directly to patients. So this really enables a cost efficient, scalable distribution platform for access to the entire Latin American market. So that kind of scalability and access, very important for thinking globally about trade, especially vital for European markets. Yeah, that's right. So if you look at sort of the, the supply chain around the globe, right, the operational logistics needs um, are always an issue. As soon as people start thinking about, hey, we want to be able to export, then the question becomes, how do we do that? Um, and certainly a lot of those South American markets have been considering that uh, because the populations are a little bit smaller. And so if they want to create a really robust economy off of the cannabis um, plant, they need to be able to export it. Um, now, Europe is one of those regions that is going to continue to be highly competitive because just as South America is looking to export there, so is Australia, so is Canada. Um, and within the continent itself, there are a lot of test markets um, in places like France and Switzerland and Italy. There's nascent movement in places like Macedonia and Poland. Um, Germany though, is gonna continue to be sort of the big talk, big market for the foreseeable future. In the UK, while um, the actual market is still sort of gaining strength, um, we all are going to have to see what the long-term effect of Brexit is there, of course. But the UK has a lot happening in terms of the national health system and being able to provide patients with reimbursement. Similar programs are beginning to be established in Germany as well. So look, in 2020, um, Europe had a total cannabis market of $359 million, give or take. Um, and $267 million of that was projected to be out of the German market. So um, Brightfield Research Group has put together this uh, report in the fall last year, which you can go find and download. And what you'll see there is they projected a 25% uh, increase in 2020, and then progressive increases in the market to 2025, resulting in a total of a $3.1 billion market. So huge growth potential there from $359 million to $3.1 billion. Obviously, there's a lot of things that would have to go right for that to happen. And the next largest countries currently behind Germany are Italy, Denmark, Poland, Austria, and the UK um, coming in behind those. So um, in looking at the report, I do trust their methodology. I know how they approached it. I think it's a, it's a good solid number to look at. Just know that um, even that team over there would, would admit that there's a lot of things that have to go right. And there's some speculation in terms of how markets will flow out. Um, I see personally this growth being driven by a couple of things. One of course is new countries come on means new consumption. Um, but there's also a diversification of the product mix. So today, most things are pharmaceutical type prescription products um, and some flour. It appears as more changes are happening that oils and capsules are going to have a place in that market pretty substantially. So I think five years from now, the pie chart showing what people, how people are consuming are going to change um, pretty significantly, and that will change the monetary equation pretty significantly as well. It's um, going to be interesting to see as the markets mature um, where that uh, continued capital for growth comes from. As you mentioned in South America, same thing in Europe, Canadian capital has driven a lot of this expansion um, and the belts are being tightened there. So I choose to look at it as a positive opportunity for um, European companies to start to control their own destiny a little bit and for collaborative partnerships between them and other sources of capital out of North America. So two words that I like to use when talking about Europe is pragmatic and patient. If you're investing in Europe and you're talking about the growth of the European market, you need to understand that they are very much 
focused on using a medicinal model, looking at a pharmaceutical model as their primary driver. And that takes time. It creates a lot of testing, a lot of red tape. Um, but as that happens, it also means that that testing and red tape creates a trusted process and procedures. You know what you're getting um, there. And so over time, it should build confidence. Um, if you look at some of the tests, like the pilot projects, for example, like the one in France, um, it's great. They're, they're building out this program to help uh, really sort of test their ability to regulate, test their testing procedures. And, um, but whoever is partnered with that has to give the cannabis away for free. So if you're investing in that market, you know that you're gonna take a loss for three years at least before you can even hope to get a positive return on any of your investment. Um, but if you're patient and if you have the capital to do that, it certainly will be a good market. You just have to look at it in the term of five to 10 year blocks as opposed to six to 18 months. Um, you know, and as a sidebar before we shift off of this, um, it's also been interesting to see some formal education programs being formed for physicians in the UK and Germany. Um, these programs are actively helping to destigmatize cannabis. So it encourages um, education of physicians, knowledge about what types of maladies using medicinal cannabis is good for. And that over time also combined with sort of the consumer uh, demand for it, I think will really provide a really super strong foundation for the long haul uh, in Europe. You know, places like Malta are working to provide business friendly entry pathways uh, for companies to enter the EU. And um, I've also heard a number of companies in Sub-Saharan Africa are looking north to Europe for expanded opportunities as well. That pipeline has been used uh, for produce, for decades. So the, that directional flow um, people are used to. Um, but of course, that, that is going to take some continued time. And, and Jill, I know you've looked at Africa more recently than I have in terms of updates. So what else are we seeing down there? Well, actually, I would say that we're seeing a lot of really exciting possibilities in Africa, though it might take some time for it to really get off the ground. Um, South Africa and Lesotho are really leading the way while some of the other countries are kind of playing the wait and see game. Um, so I, <clears throat> what I could say is that we're seeing plenty of issues in terms of capital in these countries, but some of the experts we've talked to, especially out of South Africa, believe that 2021 can be a nice launch ramp, assuming that the pandemic diminishes and the governments actually follow through on the regulations that they've uh, got in the pipeline. Uh, it's looking pretty promising right now. And uh, one trend that we're seeing with, with these governments is that they're paying particular attention to ensuring that small farmers are included and that they have the opportunity to leverage cannabis as a valuable cash crop. Uh, so that could be some really exciting changes there um, with some very important social justice impacts. Uh, this is also something that any social impact investor who really values the long term should be paying attention to is what's happening in South Africa. Um, now, I will say that for people in the US uh, in the cannabis space who are not really used to being able to transport products across state lines within our own country, uh, the reality that there are places where cannabis can be exported, imported across international borders can, you know, be a pleasant revelation at times. No kidding. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it can be a revelation, but you know, there's challenges that come with that. And Africa is um, one place that we're seeing that challenge or at least that risk of it. Um, one ongoing challenge for the African markets is the question of e EU GMP certification for being able to export to Europe. And um, geography notwithstanding, uh, we're seeing that Australia is actually edging in probably largely because of Australia's reciprocity agreements with the EU into Europe. It's helping them get access to Australian companies. Um, so Chris, I was wondering, can you pick up right there? Yeah, of course. Australia is definitely interesting. And I even had a conversation 
a couple of months ago, I guess it was in November, with some African companies who were creating trade partnerships with an Australian firm uh, in an attempt to move elements of their product into Australia to run it through EU GMP certified facilities there as sort of a roundabout way to get into the European market. Now, whether or not that's going to work out and certainly long term, that's not sustainable. Uh, it does sort of further illustrate how um, successful Australia has been, I guess, in helping to logistically figure some of these challenges out. Domestically, the Australian market is not particularly large. It's um, close to the same size and population as the state of California, for example. Um, but the Australian companies are very well aware of the fact that while they want to have a very strong and vibrant domestic uh, market and are working towards that, as a matter of fact, in the middle of Q4, uh, last year, we saw in an insurance company start to reimburse patients for cannabis medicine. So that is indeed happening. They also know that their long-term path uh, to large growth is through export of product. Um, one example, right before Christmas, uh, Little Green Pharma announced that they had successfully um, got products available for sale in Germany, and they had already done so into the UK. And then two days later, another Australian firm made a very similar announcement. So they are having success in, in figuring that out. I know having talked to several of them that um, that Little Green Pharma project, for example, took 22 months and the order was not particularly huge. I think it was in around 600,000 uh, dollars, but it was certainly very symbolic uh, in terms of what the future prospects are for those types of those types of markets. Um, if they're going to capitalize on larger population groups, then places like Australia, small countries in South America, um, they're going to have to learn how to do that. Um, other areas of the world, like, say, China or other parts of Asia, have, you know, different aspects going on. And I know you had a chance to do an interview not too long ago um, looking at, at what's going on in the Asian market. Yeah, there's a lot of regulatory challenges that are happening in Asia. It, in general, it's still very much a nascent market for cannabis. Um, but, but promising and definitely an area to watch. Um, a theme I really wanna highlight for Asia is that this is a region where we believe that cultural adaptation and in-market partners are, are more critical than probably anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's very, some very different dynamics happening in Asian markets than in the West that foreign investors uh, should be aware of. So go into, go into any opportunities there, um, knowing that you're gonna wanna find an in-market partner for one thing. So just, just as a general reminder, you know, Asia has at least, has, has probably the oldest relationship with cannabis than anywhere else in the world, going back thousands of years. So we really have them to thank a lot uh, for both cannabis and hemp, everything clothing from everything from clothing to medicine. Uh, so while business there right now might be challenging, there's a lot of potential and opportunity, uh, notably in the area of hemp. Uh, industrial hemp for building and textiles is uh, a, largely a tradition in uh, China, especially. And anybody in the CBD uh, luxury beauty and wellness space uh, should really be keeping an eye out for Asia. In China alone, um, estimates suggest that there are 800 million online shoppers who are looking for high-end luxury goods. So the CBD, beauty, and wellness space uh, could really be picking up there. Um, another key place is those who are thinking about tourism. Uh, several Asian countries really rely on tourism and uh, Thailand in particular comes up a lot, right? Uh, Thailand has legalized cannabis medicinally, uh, and we're, everybody's kind of looking to see what else they might be doing in the future. They might be pushing towards a regulatory framework that allows for more of a wellness tourism focus 
maybe not quite recreational completely, but uh, a little bit more loose than a strict medicinal market. Uh, and another theme that we that we really picked up on is um, a lesson learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Greater awareness about uh, supply chain fragility. Anybody who relied on China for their supply chain knows that they really needed to find a backup part, a backup partner, because of the COVID pandemic. Um, costs were critical, but just you know, adding in that resiliency to your supply chain uh, was a really smart business decision for people. So that's something to keep in mind for the future. Yeah, and it it also translated interestingly to a discussion we had with. Abhishek Mohan out of um, Hemp Street in the subcontinent of India, because while you had the Chinese supply chain problems going on um, in a country like India, which has a 1.3 billion person population, um, you know, he's focused not exclusively, but heavily on the domestic market there. And I think, you know, Asia has the potential uh, on the whole to do that as well. Um, while the West really has, love it or hate it, it's not a political statement, has become very reliant on, you know, that supply chain. So it's, it, it was a very good lesson, I think, for, for people to learn. Um, but but back, to, back to India, you know, they've got their an eno enormously large dispersion of economic, cultural, linguistic, religious groups, um, and all of them impact business pra practices. But across all of them, for the most part, there is this Ayurvedic tradition. Um, and cannabis is already, already a culturally accepted medicinal mm -hmm. product, which is poised for enormous growth domestically and potentially in partnership with Western pharmaceutical development. That does of course require uh, those of us in other parts of the world to pay attention to that because, um, you know, in talking to Hemp Street, uh, Abhishek was taking a very focused approach on key pain elements and talking to doctors, similar to what we were seeing in Europe, right? Talking to doctors, educating them on what the appropriate treatments were, uh, and destigmatizing the discussion even further um, to help expand the legal options throughout India. So, with a population as large as what they have, there is certainly not an immediate need for them to go abroad if they don't want to, but there's certainly a huge opportunity should they. Um, you know, all of these different business challenges and discussions and everything um, that we've just sort of plowed through. I mean, how do you possibly cover the world in 30 minutes or less? Um, what we're trying to do with the GCNC is create so solutions groups of our members to bring them together to talk about proactive ways to solve international business problems in expanding the uh, inter international cannabis marketplace. So um, we are already establishing some of those to talk about how do we look at firming up South American markets within South America and then a progressive approach to expanding into other continents like Europe. Um, I certainly am looking forward to digging into the Asia equations and looking at how we sort of continue to create partnerships and collaborations across those markets. Um, I think that is a likely discussion within the GCNC here over the next uh, six, 12 months to complement what's already being discussed in Europe and South America. So, um, you know, it is it is a lot of fun to be able to just go through this and sort of knock down the dominoes as we talk and tour through the world. Um, but for those listening who really want to get more, uh, we host the International Cannabis Conversation podcast every two, two weeks on trichomes.com. We have resources um, and YouTube channels where you can get some of what our members get to see to help inform you more. And, you know, obviously, if you have questions uh, out of all of this update, you can always reach out to us. We're happy to answer them. 
Absolutely, Chris. Um, so as you can tell, we've you know gleaned a lot of this information that we shared with you all uh, directly from the members of the global of the GCNC, all of whom really understand the value of being willing to come together and share meaningful information uh, as we as we all work together to build a strong and sustainable global industry. So um, really, we would encourage any companies or professionals who are already operating in multiple countries uh, or expect to be so in the future uh, to, to come talk to us and apply for membership. Uh, you can check out our website, which is alwaysdriveinnovation.com. And uh, with that, really want to say thank you to Denise and the Canada World Expo team for putting together uh, this incredible event and for being another excellent convener. We love to work with you and we really enjoy and appreciate um, our collaboration and we'd love to come work with you and discuss global trends and opportunities. So thanks everyone. Thank you. That is the international update in 30 minutes or less. <laughs> There's a lot of information. There's a lot of industry growth potential. Um, as Chris and Jill both mentioned uh, their their network is uh, composed of industry innovators. So if you are interested, alwaysdriveinnovation.com. It's an incredible global network. And as the U.S. and as the uh, international market expands in 2021, uh, it may be a fantastic resource for. Um, all of us here at Candle World Expo and, and uh, everybody who's watching and listening.